Glad to see you this morning. I hope you're feeling better than some of us are. Although I've heard some coughing out in the congregation, there's some stuff going around. I apologize to Jimmy and Dana Johnson. We were scheduled to baptize them this morning, but I didn't feel like they'd done anything to deserve getting that close to me. So God willing, we'll load up for next Sunday morning. And I'll drink plenty of chicken soup. hot tea and hopefully be over these, uh, this little irritation here. Well, it's New Year's Eve. Another year has come and gone. Uh, it began last year challenging one another. I challenged myself. I would like to stand here and tell you and I and I answered the challenge completely. I answered the challenge somewhat, but not completely. And God's been kind to let us live to see the end of 2017. That's not true of everybody. We pray he'll be kind to let us see the dawn of 2018. And I think these times are always good times to assess, to reassess, to anticipate. So what I want to try to do in the few minutes we have together this morning is to think about 2018, to pick up on the passage that we read responsibly and together, Philippians 3, 1 through 11, to pick up on it at verse 12 through 16, hear Paul's challenge, how we should live as Christians. Look in your Bibles at Philippians 3, 12 to 16. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text printed on the screen for you. And uh, we'd like to get a Bible in your hand. You need your own copy of the Word of God to have with you. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read verses 12 through 16. Remember what we just read. I want to know him, Paul said. I want to know him. I want to know Christ. We've, we talked about this recently, this particular passage. I don't want to depend upon my accolades. In fact, all of that stuff, which made me head and shoulders above everything that Judaism had to offer. He was the one handpicked to put down the uprising called the followers of the way, the followers of Jesus, because he was head and shoulders. He said, all that stuff is dung. And so that they don't misunderstand in Philippi what he's, what he's trying to communicate. He, he's not acting as if, look, I've arrived. No. So he makes this statement here. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. My prayer for me, my prayer for you, as the 2018, as the Lord lets us live it, will be a year when we demonstrate unequivocally that we believe the Bible is true and we believe it is sufficient, that it tells us all we need for life and godliness. We can check it and find it true and faithful and tie ourselves to its mast and be in a good spot. Thank you. Please be seated. 
when you put together the life of Paul, uh, biblical scholars generally agree that, that, that Saul was born in Tarsus around 4 BC and that he died, was executed probably around 68 AD, about 72 years of age maybe. He wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, this letter we call the Philippians, from Rome around 61 to 62 AD, some, uh, some 10 years after he had been in Philippi. So we can say that at the age of 65, he's exhorting the believers in Philippi to follow his example in living the Christian life particularly as it pertains to finishing well. In this passage we read, he uses words like obtain, press, strain, goal, prize, mature. So I ask us today, do these words find a place and your plan for how you will approach 2018? My friend and mentor R.F. Gates used to say, Bill, he said, people treat Christianity today like, like, like it's a stepping over the line. Oh, can he do, he do this? Okay, I stepped over the line now. He said, it's not a stepping over the line. It's a stepping onto a path. And he would point out to me, I'll never forget this, he would say, you know, John Bunyan did not name his famous work Pilgrim's Decision. He named it Pilgrim's Progress. And if you've read that, then you know that he, he gets onto a path. He, can, he gets through the, the narrow way, the, the, the wicked gate, that small gate, and he's on a path. This book is subtitled, The Journey from This World to the world which is to come. And you know people, and I know people, who imagine that they're Christians because they, they stepped over a line, they made a decision, and, and that was it. And that the measure of that commitment, biblically, and that's the only measure we ought to be interested in, is are you on a journey? Did you start out on a journey and maybe like some of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress, you, Progress, you got to a place to bypass meadow or you, you got under the, under the shade of a resting place and you stayed there. That language doesn't match the Apostle Paul's exhortation as a, a 65 year old he would not have known this then but but had he lived here he would have begun began to get letters like Karen and I did this last year it's time to sign up for Medicare decide what you he, he he'd been already getting those things he didn't that didn't signal slow down to him it's not what he said so I want us to see just for a few minutes today in these in these verses, five considerations. First of all, Paul says, do not live as if you have arrived because he says he hit. he's not acting that way. Secondly, purpose to press hard by straining ahead. We're going to look at those, the meaning of those words, those beefy words there. Then third, live with the goal and prize in mind. Fourth, live remembering the upward call. And then finally, live as mature Christ followers. Remind you, he is saying these things to people who 10 years before were not Christians. The church at Philippi is 10 years old. And he's exhorting them, he's expecting there to be mature believers there. He would grant by the language he uses that there are those that are, that are babes, that they've probably come in, they've been saved since he was there and they're being brought in. 
but he's giving some serious and clear exhortations to the mature. So let's look first of all at this, do not live as if you have arrived. Verse 12a, not, he's, he's given his uh, pedigree in, in the previous verses. He says, all that's rubbish, it's dung, it's a dung hill. I, I'm not clinging to any of that, of my Jewish religious accomplishments, counting on that as the standard by which I will be measured or the means by which I will enter heaven. But I'm, I want to know Jesus. It's a, I told you when we looked at that passage recently that F.F. F. Bruce, one of his commentaries, it's called this Paul's magnificent obsession was to know Christ, to know him personally, to know him intimately, to know him growingly, I've told you before, Karen and I have known one another all of our lives. I mean, I, I don't know if, we, if you're placed in the cradle role in the, pre the, the nursery area of the same church. We didn't chat in there or anything like that. But I mean, we were, we were there, and, and as, we, as we were growing up, we, we were in Sunday school together in preschool. Uh, she probably knocked me down a few times, probably got real aggressive with me, and I, I managed to handle that. Because she, by the way, as we were growing up, she grew up quicker than I did physically. And I used to look up to her, I thought, my, she's tall. So we know one another all this time. But none of that would ever lead us to believe that in our marriage, we've arrived. Married 43 years. I want to know her. I want to know her better. That's what happens when you have a relationship with somebody. I mean, what would you think? Just, just side trail here. If you were talking to somebody and said, well, tell me about your spouse. And say, nah, I know everything I need to know about. I'm moving on. I, 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 other things, other, other pursuits. You're going, oh, my soul. This, this thing's in trouble. No, Paul's magnificent obsession was to know him. And so, so he doesn't want them to misunderstand what he's saying. So he says, not that I have already obtained this. The word obtained here is, is the word for received or, or taken. I don't want you to think I've arrived. Neither should we, by the way. Uh, if you've been a believer five days or 55 years, you haven't arrived. Well, how do you know that, preacher? Well, we're told that when we go to heaven and we see him, we, sh we shall be like him, for we shall, we shall see him as he is, and we will spend all of eternity knowing him better and better and better, more intimately, more. There's so much to learn of God. God is infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his, in his being, wisdom, power, holiness. And we will spend all of eternity knowing him more. Paul says, don't think I'm telling you that I think I've arrived. And he's challenging the Philippians that they not imagine in their minds. Well, I've been a Christian. Can you imagine? Well, I've been a Christian 10 years. Aren't you? Someone said, well, I've been a Christian 55 years. Well, that's, that's glorious. Lead us. Lead us. Show, us. show us what hot pursuit of Jesus looks like. I haven't obtained this, nor am I already perfect. And the word perfect is the word complete. That kind of complete, we don't get till we get to glory. You know, uh, praise God in salvation. We, are, we have been saved from the, uh, from the penalty of sin, from its condemnation, its justification. Praise God, we are being saved the, uh, from the power of sin. That's sanctification, growing in holiness, fighting the fight of faith. But praise God, we shall be saved. We shall be saved in glorification. No more sin. Sickness. No more sadness, no more sorrow. And we're not there yet. The fact that some of us are coughing in here means we know we're not there yet. There won't be any coughs in heaven. 
no head colds, no chest colds, no flu, none of that. We're not there yet. Paul says, I don't, I don't take me wrong. So the fact that I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and be made conformable to his death doesn't mean that I think somehow I've arrived. In fact, just the opposite. Look at the second. He, he challenges them as he challenges himself, purpose to press hard by straining ahead. He says, but I press on to make it my own. Follow this. This is fascinating what he says here. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In salvation, we are gripped by grace. But being gripped by grace does not mean that we cradle in complacent comfort. Rather, having been laid hold of by Christ energizes us in the spirit to lay hold of him. I press on to make it what? That relationship with God through Christ. To make it my own. I want it to be obvious that Jesus is mine as surely as it's obvious in heaven that I am his. He uses some interesting words here. Press. It's the word that can be pursue or persecute. In fact, when you go back and read the book of Acts, when you're told that Paul was, was persecuting the church, that's the word. He was intensely pursuing the Christians. He'd been sent on a mission by the Sanhedrin. If they sent a runner and said, give us an update, Saul. And he said, well, just kind of, kind of enjoying the sights in Damascus. <laughs> it's a nice place. Been wanting to travel. I appreciate the Sanhedrin giving me this assignment so I can kind of go see the world. They'd have yanked him home. How's it coming? Well, you'd be pleased to know that I was able to apprehend one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem. Convicted him publicly, and they stoned him to death. We are slowly but surely stamping out the way. Give us time, we'll cut off the head of the serpent, the serpent will die. And I'm on my way to Damascus. I've heard there's some there too. He was, that's what he was persecuting the church. He was hotly pursuing. That's the, that's the word he uses here. How he's changed. He doesn't hotly pursue Christians to execute them now, he hotly pursues Christ. Again, not to execute him, not to persecute him, not to, not to wipe him out, but to know him. I press. And he says, brothers, I, the fact that I am pressing doesn't mean that I think that I think I have arrived. It's, I, I'm not, quote, made it my own. Well, didn't Paul have assurance? Paul had assurance that Christ had laid hold of him. He was as certain of that as he was of breathing. But he was stirred up to lay hold of Christ. It was his magnificent obsession. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Now what's What's he forgetting? Well, he's not forgetting his encounters on the road to Damascus because he tells everybody about that. When he's hauled before the leaders in the book of Acts, that's what he tells them. Well, I was out persecuting Christians, and, and lo and behold, the risen Son of God appears to me on the road to Damascus, knocks me off my, my uh, ride, and challenges me. I, I've never been the same. No, he didn't forget that. He forgets the things that he had counted on to make him right with God. Forgetting what is behind.
And I think in a redemptive way, I want to be careful here, that he would, he would forget in terms of, of, of counting on past religious encounters, that, he would, that those would fade into his anticipation of future grace. John Piper does an excellent job of this in his book, Future Grace, pointing this out, that we, we never forget our conversion experience, but you know what people, just like I know people, who don't, who don't hit a lick for Jesus today. And you talk to them and say, well, back about X number of years ago, I trusted Jesus Christ was baptized. Well, there are no spiritual stumps. Looking for some twigs here, looking for some growth coming out of this. That's what Paul's talking about. I'm not even depending on my past encounters. I'm straining forward to what lies ahead. This, this word here, strain, I am, I am extending myself. I, and I read that and I say, okay, Bill, how are you extending yourself for Jesus? Stretching is another way. How am I stretching for Jesus? How does my commitment to Christ, my commitment to his word, provoke in me a stretching motion for him. This is not super spiritual Christianity. This is normative Christianity. He is saying these things to the church at Philippi not to boast in himself, but to challenge them to ask themselves, is that me? Does that describe me? Does that sound like me? Pressing? Straining? Is my Christianity active or is it passive? And the third thing he says is to live with the goal and prize in mind. I press on. Same word, press, word persecute, pursue. I press on toward the goal. What's the goal? To know Jesus in a glorified way in heaven. Right, isn't it? I want to know him. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to visit with Brother Charlie Ward or not. 91 years old. Doesn't feel well. Every conversation we have, I, I told the Lord I'm ready. I said, I know you are. I said, probably you, you're about as ready as anybody I've ever known was ready. I said, well, do this for me. So we were, we were together the other day. I said, inhale. Exhale. It's not time yet. He's still got work for you to do. Still got work for you to do. He wants to know him in that final move of knowing him. But he's striving and he's straining. He's pressing. At 91 years of age, I tell him, I said, brother, I pray, you pray for me. I pray God will give me this kind of, of finishing tenacity. Jimmy Draper was a uh, pastor for years in Euless, Texas. I had the privilege for a season of having him as, as my, uh, my mentor in our, one of our seminary classes we had. I'd go over and spend time with him on Saturdays. And uh, he's then was president of the Sunday School Board at the Southern Baptist Convention. He's retired now. And I had the opportunity to hear him this past year in Tulsa and visit with him. And he's written a new book. I think, I think the title of it is Don't Quit Before You Finish. Don't Quit Before You Finish. It's an exhortation to keep pressing on. Press on toward the goal 
The goal is to, to be in heaven when we die. Again, Pilgrim's Progress is a, is a great read. There's a person that makes it all the way to the gate and to the celestial city. And Bunyan says, and I, there was a, tr a door that opened up by the gate and reached up and snatched that fella and dragged him down to hell. And Bunyan makes this observation. So I learned that there is a way to hell even at the very gate to the celestial city. Being a false convert. Being somebody who, you know, I just stepped over the line and that's it. You see, there's, there's a danger in that, folks. Otherwise, you don't, you don't have these verses in the Scripture that say, work out your salvation. It's in Philippians here. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. You don't, you don't have these verses that say make your calling and election sure. You don't, you don't have the exhortation to examine yourself whether you're in the faith. We have an enemy of our souls who would love to give us an experience that, that we, th we take to be salvation, to lull us to sleep and snatch us to hell when it's over. Paul is warning against that with these, with these heavy words, these action words. The goal, the prize. The prize is finally being in a position face to face with Jesus to know him. And you don't get there passively. He says, live remembering the upward call. Look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The upward call. Paul talks about in Corinthians going from glory to glory. One stage of glory to another stage of glory. Growing in grace, being more and more fitted for heaven. You do realize, do you not? That not only are we pressed upon by the word, by the, by the way, the word call here is the same word that he, whom he, whom he, for instance, he called we're summoned, this, this summoning. But we have not only the upward call that God has made to us in Christ Jesus, we have the downward call, the enemy of our souls who says, come on, eat, drink, be merry. Come on, don't make a big deal out of this. You're okay, you're safe. Come on. He's calling us downward. Downward. But there's also, there's this, there's this, this lateral call that our, that our flesh gives to us. And I think that's the most dangerous one. The lateral call is, oh, just come on the side. Don't, don't, get all, don't let that preacher get you all worked up about that, get all exercised about that, make, make you feel uncomfortable, feel bad. Don't do that. There's only one call that promises to land us in heaven. And that's the upward call of God. God doesn't call us laterally. He doesn't call us downward. He calls us upward, upward, heavenward. For believers who are young, biologically young in age, it's difficult for them to believe a day would come when strength would fail. But the upward call is yours. In full vigor, attack it. In full vigor, go after it. And when energy begins to fail and fade, it's critical that we strive we use our energies mentally, relationally, spiritually, physically to strive. When Jesus comes for me, I do not want him to find me in a hammock spiritually. I want him to find me striving, stretching, pressing. Not giving up. 
And the devil, look, the devil tempts me, he lies to me. What's, what's the use? What's the use? Come on. Quit kidding yourself. What's the use? And we fight against that. Say, no. I'm still breathing. That means I must still be straining, striving, pressing, reaching, stretching. Wanting to know the Savior who before he formed me in the womb knew me. This upward call. And then he says this, live as mature Christ followers. This church is 10 years old. <laughs> and so how, how can you have mature believers? It, it, well, that's normal Christianity. Normal Christianity. He challenged them. Listen to this. Let those of us who are mature, he includes himself in that. And he's not talking about having his AARP card, all right? He's talking about growing in the Lord, growing in grace, growing in a knowledge. A personal, intimate knowledge. But those who are mature think this way. It's a mark of maturity. Some, some people read this and go, man, that's, all that talk, that just makes me tired. That's just being immature. Watch children. Watch children. I uh, need you to help me clean the kitchen. Children will, typically will try anything initially, just, you know, the excitement of their... I'm tired. Can we quit now? Well, what are you going to say? Stop acting like a child. Well, that's what they are. They're children. I mean, you know, you, you try to help them grow in that. Mature people, he says, think this way. And, and then just in case, I love it. I love what some things Paul does. Just in case they think that, you know, Paul's made this sanctified suggestion. He says, if you think differently, God will straighten you out. God will convince you. If you're thinking differently from me, Paul says, he's, I mean, he was inspired to write at least half the New Testament. So if you're thinking differently than me, Apostle Paul, on this, uh, you keep seeking, God will show you that I'm right and you're wrong in the way you're thinking about this. That's pretty bold. But when God commissions you to write half the New Testament, you can do that kind of thing. And all we do is we read it and go, I don't want to think differently than Paul. <laughs> I don't want to brush this off. If Paul says this is the way you live the Christian life, then God help me, I want to live the Christian life like this. I don't want to fizzle. I want to wear out. Well, one, one fellow said, Christian, don't rust out, wear out. I want to wear out. And then he says, only let us hold true to what we've attained. And that's interesting. He says earlier, I've not attained. Remember, it's in stages, glory to glory. Paul, Paul is not at point zero. He is not at the beginning line. He is, he's been running the race. In fact, he will say that if, when, he, when he writes uh, at the end, I have I've run the race. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. When he writes this, he's conscious that he's running the race. He's doing what the Hebrew writer, if, if he wrote Hebrews, doing what he said, if Apollos wrote Hebrews, doing what Apollos said, that uh, therefore since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, let us run with endurance the race that has been marked out for us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. Each of us have besetting sins. They're different. My besetting sins may not be your besetting sins. But we have them. And if we don't know that we have them, then that means we're entangled by them. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance. That stretching, that pressing. The race that has been marked out 
for us. This is beautiful in the Hebrews. My race is not your race, and your race is not my race. There's a race been marked out for me, and I'm to run it. See, when you realize that's what he's talking about, and you don't say, well, I'm, I'm doing pretty good because I'm, well, I'm way ahead of so-and-so. No, that's, that's his race, not your race. How are you doing in your race? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame of it. Really and truly, I think, what happens when you've been a Christian for a while. There's, there's the danger of taking your eyes off Jesus. But yet, if we're going to run well, if we're going to finish well, we've got to keep our eyes fixed on him. He's the author. He's the one who, who originated in the, in the triune Godhead in eternity past the plan for our salvation. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's, he's the one who will bring us to the finish line. 2018 presents an opportunity to clear away the distractions that can accumulate so easily, to fix and refocus our gaze. There is no one else for me, none but Jesus crucified to set me free. Now I live. I live for him. Don't let the downward call discourage you, consume you. Don't let the lateral call of the world and the flesh sidetrack you so that you just determine to, to take ease. Respond to the upward. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, respond to the upward call that's God's call that he's issued to us in Christ Jesus and run. Well, a congregation that would seize upon this and say, by God's grace, I will run. I will press. I will strive. How do you do that? Well, I, you know, uh, you see these info commercials. And I learned this past week that I have a dad bod. A dad bod. And then I can get rid of this dad bod if I take this amazing pill. That it will, just if I take it, it will, it will actually chisel me a six pack of abs. We laugh at that, don't we? But that's why some people think about Christianity. There's no pill. There's no pill. God's plan is strive, stretch, press. To lay hold of the prize. Lay hold of him who laid hold of us. That's my prayer for me. It's my prayer for you. And we've been mentioning to you the last five Sundays that if you'll simply cultivate some good habits of blessing intentionally, sharing Table fellowship intentionally. Listening. In See, you go down, you know the list by now. Listening, learning, living sin. If there's one word that captures what Paul is talking about for us here, it's the word intentionality. Intentionality. It will not happen accidentally. It will not happen haphazardly. But intentionality. So, my challenge to myself, I give to you. May 2018 be a year where we daily cultivate habits that will provoke in us the intentional transformation that a Christian should experience normatively in becoming increasingly like Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you today. We look back. Your providence has kept us. We know people, some, some near, some far, who have, who have passed from this life into the life which is to come this past year. And yet here we are alive by your good providence. And we believe on purpose. So help us not to waste it. Help us to 
press, to strive. This year, I pray that I will do that increasingly as a believer like I've never done before. I pray that for my own. I pray that for, for this congregation. And I pray that you would gather us up collectively, give us that kind of deep conviction, and that there would be this year evangelical habits cultivated, created, sustained, improved upon that would carry us along to flex some evangelical gospel muscles to be productive for your kingdom's purpose and lives and homes and families and our, our influence in this community and around the world because we have listened to the Apostle Paul and decided we're not going to disagree with him, we're not going to dispute him, we're not going to ignore him, we're going to take his words to heart because they came to him from your spirit. Help us to grow in grace this year. I thank you for this family of faith and I pray that super abundant blessings will come upon each one, each home, that we can use those blessings and energy to become more like Jesus. as we move closer to heaven. But we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.